Okay, uh, today we are going to continue on our little course of discussing plasma kinetic equations or plasma kinetic theory. The real subject here uh, is covered in a course at the university called 725, uh, plasma kinetic theory and radiation processes. But what we want to do is just give a few highlights from that, and it's in Chen's book, so we'll follow through that and so forth. Some people regard a lot of the kinetic theory as really the, the thing you have to do in plasma physics uh, because it's how you get things called Landau damping and so forth and so on. But uh, we're not going to go too much into that. Um, anyway, so let's talk about plasma kinetic theory. But in particular, what we want to talk about is the plasma kinetic equation. Now, the idea here, well, let me kind of say, is that we last time said that what we really wanted was to have a distribution function, which was a function of three spatial coordinates, configuration space, x, y, z, three velocity space coordinates, v, x, v, y, v, z, or v, perp, angle, and theta, and v, z, uh, and time. So it's in a... Uh, its evolution, basically, in a six-dimensional uh, phase space. Now, the question would be, then, uh, if we had to calculate, as we will do some estimates on, uh, this distribution function f, what would the equation that would govern that distribution function be? Well, actually what it is is, is, is a very simple equation, which we just write down um, from on inspection, let me say, but then pragmatically, you go through the 725 to really derive it. And the basic idea is you end up saying that the total time derivative, df dt, would actually be zero in a plasma if it were not for collisions. Okay? So df dt would be zero, but since it's not, since we have a few collisions, people often write this as the partial with respect to f, of f with respect to t with a sort of subscript C for due to collisions, or more often in the kinetic theory, people write this as some collision operator on F. Now, the only thing is, df dt here is a little bit complicated because if we sort of work that out, we have that df dt itself is equal to, now since F depends on on a total of seven variables, I have, I have to take the derivative with respect to each of those seven variables. Okay? So that would be, first I'd have dx dt times df dx. So it's total dx dt and then partial df dx. And then I'd have dy dt, partial of f with respect to y. Um, and then plus dz dt, uh, partial of f with respect to z. And then similarly, I would have the uh, various vz dependences. So there would be dvz by dt, partial of f with respect to vz, um, plus dv, I don't know why I did z first, but anyway, dvy by dt, partial of f with respect to vy. And I'm kind of running out of space, so we'll make dvz by dt partial of f with respect to vz. And I'm sorry, that should have been x because we already took care of z. And I see that I left out the one that I usually write first, which is just the direct partial of f with respect to t. But now I can rewrite or uh, simplify or however you want to do it that all of this stuff is just we could write as dx dt dot df by dx. And the df by dx, we could write as the gradient of f. Okay, Just another way of writing it. And all of this stuff over here could similarly be written as dv by dt dot df by dv. 
Could I write that as a gradient also? Well, I could, and so some people write it as the gradient little subscript v, meaning gradient in velocity space of the distribution function f. Okay. So this total df dt can then be written as the partial of f with respect to t plus, uh, and I'm going to just leave it as dx by dt dot df by dx, and then plus dv by dt dot df by dv. Now, I've got a bunch of uh, partials here. What do I uh, really mean by those partials? Um, well, the partial of f with respect to t means that I have to take that partial at constant position x, namely constant all the rest of the phase space variables, x and v, whereas the partial of f with respect to x should be a vector quantity there, should be taken at constant time and speed v, or velocity v, and then my partial of f with respect to v should be taken at constant time and spatial position x. Okay, so this is df dt. Let's now kind of specify, uh, write this out again. Let me just say it that way. Uh, and then we'll clarify what it means. So we've got df dt is equal to the partial of f with respect to t plus this dx dt dot df dx uh, plus dv dt uh, dot df dv. And I'm going to make this now our plasma kinetic equation is equal to collision operator on f, or this is the one that people sometimes write as the partial of f with respect to t, uh, subscript c, which means um, the collision operator. Okay, now really the distribution function f is made up of lots of particles in the plasma. So really, I can think of, and this is what you do in this 725 class when you work through full plasma kinetic theory, I can think of dx dt as if I'm moving along a particle orbit. So if I do, I would identify that dx dt is just v. And what would dv dt be? Well, it would just be the acceleration. Or if I was you know, looking at f equals ma with the uh, force equals mass times acceleration, with the Lorentz force, uh, what I would write is that m dv dt uh, is equal to the Lorentz force q e plus v cross b. So uh, we then, and this of course would be the acceleration. So the way you usually see this plasma kinetic theory, kinetic equation written is as not df, not total df dt, but anyway, partial of f with respect to t plus v dot df dx plus, and then the acceleration is the uh, force, this is the Lorentz force, and then force per unit mass, so people write it as uh, q over m e plus v cross b dot df dv is equal to collision operator on f. And that's the form in which the plasma kinetic equation is usually written. So let's write this plasma Now, there's some trickiness in what people call this plasma kinetic equation. Some people call it a Boltzmann equation because it's more or less like a Boltzmann equation, and you can think of there as being a collision operator. Other people, and I guess I'm one of those, do not like to call it a Boltzmann kinetic equation because the particular collision operators we use are only the, what you might call, small momentum transfer limits or small angle scattering versions of the Boltzmann collision operator, and they, in fact, embody collective effects, or in particular the left-hand side, 
also embodies collective effects. So some people call this the uh, Boltzmann equation. But um, usually when one thinks of the Boltzmann equation, uh, one thinks of single particle effects or, or uh, neutral collisions or something like that. And so uh, most people prefer to call it plasma kinetic equation. Um, and that's basically to try to embody the fact that in the Boltzmann equation, you're usually interested in neutral particle collisions. Whereas, oh, but you can do some charged particle collisions. Whereas in the plasma kinetic equation, you have in mind, uh, let's call them small angle Coulomb collisions within a device sphere. and then plus collective effects. So yes, you can say it's the Boltzmann equation, but what you actually use it for um, turns out to be um, considerably different. Now, next let me sketch uh, a little bit about the collision operator, and then, um, and then we'll... Um, bypass that after this. Uh, namely, we'll go to a sort of collisionless plasma. So let's talk about the collision operator. The, uh, I should say, in plasmas, the most general one in a way is indeed the Boltzmann collision operator, but we will not use that. Um, the simplest model is that people use is something called a Crook collision model. Uh, that's after a gentleman named Crook, K-R-O-O-K. And the idea of the collision operator is it wants to relax the distribution function back to some equilibrium Maxwellian distribution. So all you do is you say, well, I'll, I'll relax on a time scale tau the distribution function back to the Maxwellian. You can see that if I make this equal to df d tau, this would just give me exponential decay of the distribution function back towards the distribution function f Maxwellian. Um, this basically, uh, this one conserves particles in that if you integrate over all velocity space, it doesn't create or destroy particles. Uh, but it turns out it doesn't conserve um, momentum or energy, so, but not. You can then fix up additional um, modifications of this, which have to do with flow distortions and energy distortions, which will also conserve momentum and energy, but then it gets to be um, a more complicated thing. What, you, what is the sort of real or most appropriate collision operator in plasmas is the so-called Fokker-Planck collision operator. And what it looks like is it's a minus d by dv dot um, delta v times f and then plus one half uh, d squared by dv by dv double dot um, delta v. Actually, these should be averaged over the distribution function delta v uh, times f. And the idea of this is that in any particular Coulomb collision, the particle changes its velocity a little bit, namely a delta v, and you then ensemble average that over a whole bunch of collisions. And so this delta v is the delta V uh, due to a single Coulomb collision. And then what you do is you, you average over random collisions. But the other thing I want to emphasize about this Oh, and one sort of important thing is that in Chen's uh, book, this 
plus sign is actually miss, missing in the um, in the text, and so you should just correct the book when you when you look at where he talks about the Fokker-Planck equation. There's supposed to be a plus there. The equation just somehow got all jammed together. So this first term, what it represents, is what is what's called dynamical friction. You remember when we talked about Coulomb collisions, basically what happened was if the plasma had a flow in one direction, Coulomb collisions tried to relax that flow. And this is the term that causes that so-called dynamical friction. In addition, Coulomb collisions turn out to be a scattering process in velocity space, an angular or diffusive scattering. And so this last term is basically the diffusion uh, in velocity space. Um, now you can see that if I uh, equate this collision operator to df dt, that then, and, and balance it against this, this would be df dt is equal to some coefficient times the second derivative of f with respect to v squared. And so that would be, um, that would be a diffusion equation. And it's in, it's in velocity space, so it's not real space, but, but anyway. Um, that, so, so, the uh, so the Fokker-Planck Coulomb collision operator is, let me say, the, the real one you end up using when you're trying to do real good kinetic theory. But what we will want to talk about is actually a case where we more or less neglect collisions. Um, and so let me just uh, mention that. So if we neglect collisions, what we mean by that is that we're interested in cases where the frequency of the oscillations we're interested in are, in fact, much greater than the collision frequency. So we're trying to do it with some reason. Um, so we're interested in time scales or rapid processes compared to uh, the... Uh, uh, Coulomb collision relaxation rate. And for that, what we obtain is what's usually called the Flazov equation. But some people call it the collisionless Boltzmann equation or collisionless plasma kinetic equation. And all it is is then df dt is equal to zero because we're not creating or destroying particles. Hence, f is constant in time, actually. So it's equal to df dt plus v dot df dx plus q over m uh, e plus v cross b dot df dv is equal to zero. So that's our kinetic equation, uh, the so-called Flasov equation. Now, one little additional item that we need, because we're going to try to write these, we're going to try to take some moments of this equation, is there's an additional form you can write the kinetic equation in, or the Flasov equation here. Oh, Flasov was a Russian in the 30s who first wrote out this sort of equation. Um, the, the equation, what we want to do is manipulate this a little bit because we're going to want, in a moment, to take the integral, to get, take moments of this equation over all velocity space. And if we take the moment of the first one, we can see that we can take d by dt outside and we'll have the integral d cubed v of f, and that'll just give us the density. But these other terms are a little bit awkward, and we'd like to have them in, in what's called a conservative form. So to do that, Let's consider this term. I could also write this as d by dx dot vf, a total derivative, but then I would have to subtract the term. I mean, this is only one term out of that, and I'd have to subtract the other term. And that other term would be uh, d by dx dot v. What's d by dx dot v? Well, it's zero, and why? Well, x and v 
in this kinetic theory, x and v are independent phase space variables. Okay? In the six dimensional phase space. Um, so that means that I can write this as partial of f respect to t plus part, um, partial with respect to x or gradient dot vf. The v can come inside or outside is what it really means. Um, what about the last term? Well, in a similar sense, we can write the last term as the acceleration. Okay, that's what, that's what all of that is, of course. That's the acceleration. So acceleration dot df dv is equal to um, the divergence in velocity space of acceleration times f. And then we have to subtract off the other term, which is f divergence in velocity space of the acceleration. Now, in a moment, I'm going to show you that this is actually 0. Um, and, and so it'll only also be in this particular form. But let's see how we show that. Namely, we have the divergence in velocity space in the, of the acceleration is equal to, and now it's d by dv dot Q uh, over mass, E plus V cross B. What's the divergence in velocity space of the electric field? Well, first, what's the E field depend upon? Well, the E field depends upon uh, space and time. But it doesn't depend upon the velocity space coordinate. You know, the electric field is a value at a certain position, and it hasn't, doesn't depend upon what the velocity is, right? So therefore, d by dv operating on that, whether it's a gradient, a divergence, or whatever, you know, that actually vanishes. There is no effect. How about the last part? Well, certainly, d by dv dot b, likewise, magnetic field doesn't depend upon the velocity of the particle. It's, you know, it's an electromagnetic wave. It depends upon where you are in space and at what time you measure it. So uh, that also is zero. So what this all turns out to be then is just Q over M. And now uh, the remainder, let's put it that way, is we have a d by dv dot uh, V cross B. And then you have to sort of work this out. Um, and it turns out that this is uh, d by dv cross v dot b, and then minus uh, uh, v dot, and the one I, I said I wasn't going to take into account, but I guess I am. Uh, d by dv cross b. But again, b only depends upon x and t. It doesn't depend upon velocity. So that vanishes. And this d by dv cross v, what is that? Well, if I had done it in real space coordinates, that would be like the curl of x, of the, of the vector x, the spatial position vector. And that's 0. So the curl of a vector is zero. So what does all this mean? Well, what it basically means is that I can take these d by dx's and move them outside, and the d by dv and move it outside, and I can write the Flasov equation, or could have written the plasma kinetic equation, in a particular form called the conservative form. So let's write that. So Flasov equation in conservative form. If you don't do this, then when you start taking all these um, integrals that you're interested in, you find you're having to integrate by parts a bunch more than you like. So it becomes df by dt plus 
uh, d by dx dot vf plus uh, d by dv dot acceleration on f is equal to zero, where we'll just keep in mind that the acceleration is q over m times e plus v cross b. And this is sort of the most uh, convenient form for taking, um, you know, various uh, moments. The other form is more convenient for ordinary manipulations like linearization, things like that. Okay, well, so this is our officially our kinetic equation. Uh, and now what we would like to do is to show that indeed we can derive the fluid equations which we have been using, density conservation, momentum conservation, from this equation. And maybe we might learn something about some of the approximations we've been making along the way. So let's take the integral d cube v moment of this equation. And this should give us then the density conservation equation. So if we take the integral d cube v of df by dt, the integral over all velocity space is taken effectively at constant t and v, okay, because they're independent phase space coordinates. So I can take the partial with respect to t outside. And so this can be then written as the partial with respect to t of the integral over all velocity space of f. And what is that? Well, this is what we would ordinarily define as the plasma density n of x and t. Okay? So this just becomes partial of n with respect to t. So that was the integral of the first term. What if I take the integral over all velocity space of the next term? Um, well, we have, again, d by dx dot vf. Now, again, the integral over all velocity space I'm sorry, is taken at constant t and x. So I can take the velocity, the uh, spatial derivative outside. And this then becomes d by dx dot integral d cube v of vf. And what is that moment? Well, that's the moment we define as n of x and t times the velocity v of x and t. Now, I write this one with a capital V because that's the whole macroscopic fluid flow velocity. That species as a whole flows with that velocity capital V. On the other hand, little v means a particular point in velocity space where I have a few particles with that particular velocity or speed and so forth. So uh, now, so then just to write out this term, this becomes d by dx dot nv. Or what we often write this as, of course, is the divergence of nv. What about the last term? If I take the integral over all velocity space of d by dv dot acceleration on f. How about I take d by dv outside this time? How about I can't do it, right? Because that's what I'm trying to integrate over, okay? But now, if I had told you that this was a spatial derivative and I had d cubed x and I had d by dx dot, I would have called that a divergence in velocity, a divergence in real space, okay? Integral over all, real, all space, divergence in real space. So what I would have done is simply converted that into a surface integral, okay? I convert the divergence of something into a surface integral, and it's a surface integral dot acceleration times f. Where is that surface integral? Well, I integrated over all velocity space, so in some sense I went from zero to infinity in each of the coordinates vx, vy, vz, okay? So when I say where is, the, where is the surface, the surface I'm interested in is the surface at infinity, okay? It's sort of, you know, out at infinity. Now, 
in order to have a distribution function which has a finite number of particles, I'd better not have any particles out at infinity. Okay? So this is a surface integral out at infinity where there are no particles. So this goes to zero basically because uh, of the fact that f at infinity goes to zero. You know, there are no particles out at infinite velocity. So indeed, when I uh, put all this together, my integral over all velocity space of the uh, momentum equation gives me just those first two terms. And so we get dn dt partial of n with respect to t plus divergence dot nv is equal to zero, which is what we expected density conservation. Now, um, can I stop there? Well, density is something I presumably know and want to know its evolution of. But the problem is, in order to know it, I have to know something about the velocity, the flow velocity v. How do I know the flow velocity v? Well, if I went back to my kinetic equation and took a moment of it, a momentum moment of it, I would get an evolution equation for that flow velocity v. So the next step, so to speak, is take the integral d cube v mv uh, of Flasov equation. And this should give us our momentum equation, momentum balance equation. And that, in turn, should give us a, an equation, you know, dv dt is equal to a bunch of stuff. This particular pen's not doing too well. Okay, so what we need to do now is then go back and start taking moments of each of those terms. So let's take first the integral dqv of uh, mv df by dt. What does that become? Mass doesn't depend upon time, okay? We're non-relativistic here and stuff. And the speed v is again an independent coordinate, phase space coordinate. So therefore, I can take the partial with respect to t all the way outside. And this then becomes the partial with respect to t the integral over all velocity space of m v f. And what is that? Well, that's the mass, okay, that comes outside, and then the integral over all velocity space times v f, and this becomes then just uh, capital V, the flow velocity, times n. Should have put it in the opposite order. So anyway, it becomes part m partial with respect to t of nv. So that one's not too bad. Um, the next term we need to take the velocity moment is this d by dv dot vf. So let's do that. So we have the integral dq v of mv d by dx dot vf. Again, um, on this integral, I can take the uh, gradient in real space or configuration space out. And I can also take the mass out. But I guess I don't want to in this case, come to think about it. So this just becomes d by dx dot, or divergence, of the integral d cubed v of m v v times f. First off, what kind of a function is that? Well, it's not just a vector, okay? It's sort of two-vector, right? So it's actually what's called a tensor, okay? Second-rank tensor. Um, and so we need to do a little bit with that, let's say. What do we do about it? Well, what do we think 
if we just had mv squared f, that would give us sort of the energy, right? But then also, you remember, d cubed v always gives us an n. So that would give us density times energy or density times temperature. So this is sort of like pressure, right? Um, and so let's imagine that we were trying to do pressure. But we first proceed, let me say, a little bit more formally to manipulate this. What we do is we say, well, really, the velocity v is probably equal to some flow velocity in the plasma plus some departure from that. Uh, so we could look upon w is some um, velocity in a frame moving with the flow velocity, capital V. So w is namely V minus V. Then, I'll sort of need this later, if I took the integral d cubed V w of f, that would give me uh, the integral d cubed V of V minus capital V f. And this would give me n v minus n v is equal to zero. So indeed, there's no net flow velocity in this moving frame. So how do I use that up here? Well, I go back to what I was interested in, which was the integral d cubed v of m v v f. And I plug in for each of the two v's, capital V plus w. So this becomes the integral d cubed v m uh, w plus v, w plus v, f. Uh, now I have to uh, expand this, and with this sort of operation, you have to be careful to hold things in the same order. So first we get a, as we multiply these out, it's a sort of outer product type of, as opposed to a dot or inner product. So it's w, w, okay, then plus v, w, plus w, v, and then plus v, v, all times f. So if we now write this out as individual integrals, this becomes integral d cubed v m w w f plus the integral d cubed v. Uh, now this one I could take the capital V outside and I get w f inside. And then this one I get integral d cubed v w f with the v outside on the right. Notice I'm being careful to preserve the order here. And then we have, I guess I should write it as v, v, integral d cubed v, m, f. But now, as I showed above, in the moving frame, okay, these two integrals are actually zero. This integral just becomes mn. And what about the first integral? Well, it's actually what we're going to call the pressure tensor. And I'll uh, specify that in just a moment. So let's, for the moment, just call the pressure tensor. And then this is plus m uh, n v v. Now, where we have defined the pressure tensor is equal to the integral d cubed v of m relative velocity, relative velocity times f. Is that what we usually mean by pressure? Well, the answer is not quite, because what we usually mean by pressure is actually something isotropic. Okay. So let's recall what we mean by pressure and, and then relate it back to this. So let's call it usual uh, definition of pressure. And because there's three degrees of freedom, um, 
what we usually mean by pressure is the integral over all velocity space of mv squared, but by pressure we mean in the moving frame, so it's really mw squared. And then because there are three, you end up getting an mw squared over, over three um, f. How does that differ from this? Well, a little bit. And so what people usually do is they write the pressure tensor as uh, the isotropic pressure P times an identity tensor. So that's the identity of the isotropic part. And then they write plus pi, where pi is a stress tensor. So um, it's called a um, stress tensor. So let's, let's call this isotropic pressure. If you're nearly Maxwellian or something, that'll always be the dominant part. And then this is an anisotropic pressure part of the pressure tensor. And this is often called the stress tensor. And it's actually traceless because all the trace you put into the isotropic pressure turn out, turns out. So it's a, it's a traceless tensor. And if you want then a definition for pi tensor, it will be then the integral dqv of m, and then there's a w, w, but then I'd better subtract off the isotropic part with the identity tensor, so it becomes w squared over 3 times the identity tensor on f. So all this was in search <laughs> of taking the momentum moment of this term here in the equation. So we got the time, time derivative of this one, momentum, or, uh, the momentum moment of that one, the momentum moment of that one now, and we finally need this last one. So let's uh, work on that one. So we want the integral dqv m v of the divergence in velocity space of the acceleration f. Um, what do I do here? Well, first off, I surely can't take this outside. It doesn't commute with either the velocity space integral or v. But what I can do is I can make it into a form which looks like it commutes. So I can make or I'm into a total divergence form. So I can make it into a form of d by dv dot uh, v a f. But then I'll have to subtract off the part, you, you know, this is a complete derivative, and I'll have to subtract off the other part that is not there. And that, namely, is equal to dv by dv dot a f. Again, this first integral we convert into a surface integral at infinity. Uh, and even though it's dotted into a tensor now, we don't care. Uh, it, it still vanishes because f vanishes at the um, way out, so to speak, uh, out on the surface at infinity. Now, what do we mean by that d by dv dot d by dv, or by dv? Well, if you go back to what we've sort of done, it's a cryptic way of writing something, but in any case, what it turns out to be is simply the identity tensor. And then if you take the identity tensor and dot it into anything, it is whatever that other thing was, and so it just becomes AF by itself. Now, what was the acceleration here? Well, it was this, remember, Q over M, E plus V cross B. Okay, so we just stick all this back, and remembering my remembering my minus sign, we have m q over m integral over all velocity space of the acceleration, which is now just the Lorentz force, and then q plus v cross b f. The two masses cancel. The first integral 
um, well, so this is minus q. And the first integral just gives me n e, because the integral over all velocity space e is only a function of configuration space coordinates. So it's just the density moment. And the other moment is a n v moment. So I'll get an n v cross v. Or the way we find it most convenient to write this is to take the n outside. So this becomes n q e plus v cross v. So now we're ready to collect together all of the pieces that we had of the momentum balance equation. So let's do that. The first term was an m partial with respect to t of nv. The next term was the divergence, but we'll still write it as d by dx dot mnvv plus pressure tensor. And then finally, we had this term we just worked out, the Lorentz force term, nq e plus v cross b is equal to zero. Now, we could stop here, so to speak, and just leave it in this form. But it's a little more convenient to write it out in terms of uh, or taking account of the density conservation relation. Um, because here you can see we've got in, embedded in this a partial n with respect to t, and the density conservation relation was, in fact, dn dt plus del dot nv equals 0. So let's just sort of start working that out, namely, and we'll put these first two terms together, it turns out, to do this. So we'll get um, mn partial of v with respect to t, just chain rule differentiation, plus v partial of n with respect to t. So that's those two terms. And then these terms, uh, again, take the mass outside and then take the chain rule differentiation. Um, and um, it gets a little complicated to get all these in the right form, but anyway. So you get a, a, a term which is v, v dot grad n, uh, and then plus n del dot v, v, and then plus n v dot del v. Or, well, we sometimes write this as, put the parenthesis there. Now, uh, if you look at these two together, the V is kind of outside on both of them. And so you can make this V of del dot NV. And then if you look at the combination of those two terms, you can show that it's V times dn dt plus del dot nv. But that was our good old density conservation relation, namely 0. And so sort of using all of this, I guess, is the best way to say it, then what our equation becomes is just m n partial of v with respect to t. So that was this term right there. And then the only thing that's the residual out of this is this term over here. So I'll stick it down here. Um, and it was plus m n uh, v dot del v. And then there's this plus the divergence. This is actually divergence in configuration space of the pressure tensor and then minus nq e plus v cross b is equal to 0. And then um, the more normal way of writing this 
is you remember partial with respect to t plus v dot del was just the convective derivative as we had it before. So that's just d by dt. So the way people usually write this is mn dv dt is equal to. And now these two terms, these two force terms, people usually force density terms, people put on the right-hand side, nq e plus v cross b, the Lorentz force density, minus the pressure tensor. Um, So this is our momentum balance equation, and that indeed is the equation we used before, with the exception now that our pressure tensor became the pressure, Pi, okay, plus some stress tensor, Pi, some traceless stress tensor, Pi. So you remember, in a way, we got into this calculation of the momentum balance equation because we said, well, the density conservation equation was not sufficient. It had an unknown in it, the flow velocity. So now I have an equation for the flow velocity. Is that complete? Well, it's got this thing over here called pi, okay? And I need some, I mean, you know, I sort of know what the density is in the electric field and B field from the uh, Maxwell's equations, but what am I going to do about pi? And I could have a constant temperature plasma, so I wouldn't have to worry about that. Could have taken an energy equation, energy moment as well. What about pi? Well, if you look back, you'll see that our definition of pi was that it was the integral dqv m w w uh, minus w squared over three identity tensor on f. So what could we do to handle pi? Well, we could take this moment of the kinetic equation, okay, the integral dQ v uh, m w w minus w squared over 3 identity tensor uh, on uh, Flasov equation. And that would give us, it turns out, an equation for the time derivative of pi with respect to t is equal to a bunch of stuff. Now the only trouble is, if you look back through our pattern, you'll find that there's one term, which is the divergence of what amounts to a third rank tensor, WWWF. So, you know, this story is beginning to get a little old by this time, and agonizing as far as algebra goes, right? And so, you know, what you have to do if you wish to use the fluid equations is you need what are called closure relations. And hopefully you can find reasons, although it depends upon the particular situation, uh, let's say for pi in terms of n, v, etc. Or alternatively, well, you, you, know, you try to solve uh, approximately that way. Um, so that you don't have to do that. So the idea is that the fluid equations are never closed in themselves. You take, you know, the density moment of the equation, and it depends upon the flow velocity moment. So then you take the flow velocity moment of the kinetic equation, and it depends upon the pressure tensor or stress tensor moment of the kinetic equation. And, you know, each one, it's a hierarchy. Each one depends upon the next one. And so you have to figure out how to do some closure relation rigorously to close the fluid equations and make them self-consistent. Now, on the other hand, so, so this is how you derive these fluid equations, but you can't usually close them. So what you end up doing is instead, when you cannot get the closure relations, what you have to do is you have to go to kinetic theory. So when one cannot, determine or derive, let's say, uh, closure relations, terminate the series, basically. You must do kinetic theory. Um, but this shows you how you go about um, you know, collecting together the various terms, or 
taking various moments of the kinetic equation to get the fluid equation and tries to make clear how it's a non-closed process. Uh, it goes on forever. It's a hierarchical process. And you, unless you can find some clever way for particular situations like short mean free paths, short collisional mean free paths, or something like that, of closing the equations, uh, you usually cannot close them, it turns out. The Flasov equation, take moments of it, and it's not closable, it turns out, because there's no relaxation processes in it. Okay, so after a little bit of a break here, what we'll discuss is, uh, is going on to, okay, what are some of the general properties of the Flasov kinetic equation, and how do those manifest themselves in various plasmas?